Our next speaker um, is somebody who whose content is particularly close to, to my heart as um, he's talking about KPIs and performance and obviously management styles. And David Bovis runs a business called Ducks in a Row, which I, I think is a fantastic name, David. Um, and David's going to share with us some of ins his insights around neuroscience, behavioral psychology, and how behaviors um, need to be influenced, how we drive behaviors to drive the right KPIs. And we all, we all love KPIs, don't we? Love our KPIs. So please put your hands together for David Bovis. Where do I start? Uh, I, I was trained as an engineer. I then got involved in problem solving. And because an engineer, you have to solve problems and find out what's going wrong when you're building things. Um, and then I realised after 10 years of doing that all around Europe, uh, promoting lean and world class and all those lovely buzzwords that come from yesteryear, um, and some of them still exist, of course, that the real root cause issue was with people. And, and I kind of got a, an interest in the psychology and why people tick. Uh, and I hope you've been making plenty of notes because uh, there should be some nice lines you can draw to leading by example and leading through fear and all those kind of things when we go through this today. So a little bit of a sanity check first things first. If I can see uh, hands, we're going to look at this, um, how we become who we are, but I'm going to stick to the, the nature rather than the nurture. I'm going to look at this other issue, how targets and KPIs complement or contaminate what we do. But that sanity check first. You've all heard of a neuron? Yeah? Yep. No? Yep. Hands? Come on, some interaction is required, so I know. <laughs> Super, excellent. Right, well, this is the guy in 1873 who allowed us to find out what a neuron was, just to put a little bit of context around it and show how long this has been going on for. His name's Camillo Golgi. Just after he found these neurons, um, through using a silver nitrate stain to take one cell out of the cerebellum and look at it, this guy who's got a fantastic name, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, he drew them and that's what they look like. So, cool, huh? Imagine doing that in 1870s. He didn't stop there, he kept drawing them and drawing them and drawing them. <laughs> <laughs> we really started to realise that we're quite complex people. So, that was where we ended up with this knowledge um, and then of course there was a lot of religion about and it said men are much better than beasts and you know all these things can't really apply to us but we have managed to get forward and skip forward a hundred years and instead of seeing hand-drawn neurons like this we've now got this fantastic technology that we can look inside our skulls so you heard of fMRI scanning yeah and PET scanning and all these wonderful things and it's really really good and what you can see here is that when we're first born, our brains don't look like they do when we're big. Okay. Um, by two years, they're not too far off what they look like when we're fully grown, and by ten years, they're almost there. Um, the important thing to note is that in the first three years, we go from 25% to 85% of our neural mass. Okay. So the first three years are really, really important. And they're important because what we do is we get sensory stimulus coming in from the people we interact with, our primary caregivers, our mums, dads, brothers and sisters. Okay. What happens if we don't get good stimulus? And when I mean good stimulus, at, at 10 months old, we go from being able to recognise speech patterns. So um, we can hear that la 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 in people's voices when they talk to us, especially with that baby talk, to be able to discern between one language and another. And that happens between 10 and 11 months in a four week period. Okay, so the brain has actually got this pre programmed capacity to develop. But if we don't get the right stimulus, it, it doesn't do damage, it just doesn't provoke the right growth. So if we get to three years old and we haven't had that input from our parents, we end up with great big holes in what we're capable of doing. Okay? That's where we start. That's us. That's all of us in this room. We all had that same input. We've all got similar brains. And they all started off with a base unit. So we're, we try and group it together and we put it into models so we can understand it. And right up to the first year, we're really talking about um, bio-survival. Eating, sleeping, Maslow's lower levels, all that kind of stuff. Okay, by the time we get to three years old, we're starting to establish our boundaries. Um, and this is uh, the emotional territorial imprinting phase. And what that means is that we get really embarrassed when our kids throw themselves on the floor in Tesco's and say they're not moving any further. Yeah, been there, done that. So we get to about the age seven and our brain is progressing all the time. The more sensory stimulus, the more interaction with the world. We've moved from crawling to controlling our bladders and not having to use nappies anymore. And we're getting much better at interacting with the world. And we learn language and we've got Broca's and Wernick's region in there in the brains all developing and going forwards. 
And at around the age seven, we, we get to this next stage where we can start to learn semantically. So we've gone bio-survival, emotional territorial, semantic learning phase, and then we get into this bit, teens. Yeah. <laughs> so we all know how teenagers act, don't we? They're great. Yeah. <laughs> No, genuinely they are. <laughs> what, what happens is really interesting. They get um, glucose energy moving around their brains. And um, when they get to about 13 or 14, and it, it varies, of course, by person by person due to DNA, but we're not going on to the, the nature side of it, just the nurture. The, 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 prune, the, the 100 billion neurons get pruned back to about 85, 86 billion neurons because all the things that we have the potential to learn, we don't need depending on our environment. So we, we've started to solidify the things that we do need. Okay, and that gives us, so people in the Serengeti that are avoiding lions are going to have a very different neural construct than people avoiding buses in London. That's what it boils down to. Okay, so the, the trouble is, our parents, when we were little, when we were back down there at one and three, we're little kamikaze pilots, aren't we? We just, we want to kill ourselves because we'll, we'll touch hot things and we'll jump off stuff that's too high and we'll run out in front of cars. Won't we? Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we do. Um, our parents, what do they do? They stop us because they love us. And they go, no, you can't do that. Don't run there. Don't do this. Don't do that. So what do we learn? We're not good. And if we do things that we're not approved for, of, or for, we, we, we don't get loved because mum and dad frowns and that's a really bad face to see. Okay? So we end up with this thing called compulsive and inhibitive conditioning. So we're compelled to do things. You will do this or you will not be loved. Or inhibitive, you will not do this or you will not be loved. And what it leaves us with is this deep feeling that we're not good enough. Okay? We're not worthy. So teenagers really act this out sometimes, don't they? You've seen these guys? <laughs> <laughs> So what it comes down to is when we're told what to do at a very, very deep psychological imprinting level, it's destructive. It undermines us. It doesn't make us feel good about ourselves. So we mentioned fear. Somebody mentioned fear in their presentation this morning already. It leaves us with these imprinted fears of failure <coughs> and rejection. We don't like to be bad in the world. We like to be good. And if we're not, then we start to suffer from depression. Okay. So I guess, can you associate to that? Yeah, being picked last in the football team at school. God, that makes me feel, <laughs> takes me back. <laughs> yeah, it leaves us with problems in life. Um, you know, we, we, we yearn for approval, uh, and it's really, really deep in us. Um, it can survive into adult life, but uh, that's too personal. Let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> there's good news, okay? The good news is that there's this thing called neurogenesis. And what it means is all that growth that goes on when we're small carries on. It's really, really fast when we're tiny, and it slows down as we get into adulthood, but it doesn't ever stop. Okay? So we can grow new neurons and new neural nets to cope with the world as we experience it. And that's obvious because if we move country, we learn new languages. Okay? That's a new neural net. Okay? If we move companies, we, we recognise new faces. They're new neural nets. Okay? Our brain changes and adapts constantly throughout life. That's how we're adaptive. A guy called Sebastian Sung speaks about this in terms of four R's, and it's really interesting because neurons change the way they connect in these four different ways, generally. So re-weighting, they strengthen or weaken the connection. Okay. They create or eliminate synapses when they reconnect. So you can get neurons that go to have one neural network through their dendritic tree and move to a different one. Okay. You can grow and re-attract branches when they rewire and do all this kind of stuff, and you can create new neurons completely from scratch from things called progenitor cells, which are like stem cells in the brain. Okay, so we're really pretty clever. Uh, not that we know it, and we don't do it consciously, of course, but it's pretty impressive when you find out. So what makes that happen? Two things mainly. The external world interacting with, with everything, stimulus, but also how we think and what we imagine. This is Hebb's law. What wires together, fires together. Yeah, or fires together, wires together even. And what it does is it leaves us with opinions, interpretations. It allows us to make assumptions because if we can jump to conclusions really quickly about other people and about things, we can stay safe much faster in the world and we can, make, we can save glucose energy because that requires food. And if we eat food, our stomach turns it into glucose energy, it feeds the brain. The brain's not very green, it's not very energy efficient at all. It uses 20% of all the energy we produce. So we try and do what we can at a neural level to protect that energy consumption. And what it does is it allows us to make snap decisions and infor informed opinions about things. So you'll get an opinion about that picture. So who would say the left-hand side is good? 
or the right-hand side is good? Yeah? Right, okay. Left, so one person, yeah, the green probably is a, a trigger. Maybe beaches, sand reminds you of sun and holidays. Don't know. It will be because of your particular neural nets that you interpret that picture in a particular way. Okay, so for our experience, we determine, and this is the key word, it always comes back down to being philosophical. What's good, bad, right or wrong in the world? What do we, how have we been imprinted over the years through our sensory experience and our imagination about what the world is going to deliver to us about what is good, bad, right or wrong? And as leaders, that's really, really crucial to understand what we understand to be good, bad, right or wrong in terms of what's good for people to perform well in our businesses, what's good in the long term, not just the short term, end of month, end of quarter, which is unfortunately where the Western world has gone in recent years. In simple terms, we can say, we form beliefs, okay? what we loosely for call beliefs, because belief as a word encompasses everything that we've just been talking about. So, there's my model. Um, Dr. Deming had a lovely model called PDCA. Has everybody come across that? Plan, do, check, act. Yeah? Well, this one balances it up because that's too logical. We're not logical beings, we're emotional beings. So what we believe, which incorporates all that kind of stuff we've been talking about, the emotional, environmental experience, the language we use, our values, all those kind of things we're imprinted by, determines what we think. And that's that little voice in our heads. You know the one where you can completely lose yourself when you're driving, and you wake up three miles later and wonder how you got there, and then you remember that you've been thinking about something else. And there's this thing called metacognition, which means thinking about your thinking. And you can actually start to become aware of that little voice in your head. We're not mad. We all do it, honest. <laughs> and we do it a lot. That little voice runs at anything between 300 and 1,500 words per minute in our heads. We're constantly talking to ourselves. And what's interesting is, and depending on our levels of self-worth, our self-concept, sometimes, especially if we add a lot of negative comments as children, those deep imprints from childhood can sound like our mum's voice, making us feel guilty over the, you know, this little devil on our shoulder talking to us. So that drives what our belief is, what we've been printed by drives our thinking patterns, and we talk to ourselves in a positive or negative way. That triggers a little tiny bit in the middle of the brain right back here, about there, called the amygdala, and the amygdala controls all of our emotional responses, releases chemicals in the brain. So you heard of dopamine, and oxytocin, norepinephrine, yeah, serotonin, all those kind of things. That's what is happening. When we talk about emotions and we say we have feelings, what we're saying is we've got a different chemical mix in our brain. Okay, so this is getting root cause of people issues. So depending on what we think, which triggers the re release of those chemicals, depends on how we feel. And depending on what we're thinking and feeling about something, the assumptions we're making to save glucose energy determines how we act. Yeah? So that's why we end up doing the things we do in the world, because of all that process that's been going on inside our heads. So if you want people to act differently at work, guess what? You've got to change the sensory stimulus you've exposed them to. Okay? And that's the PES model is the physical, emotional, social and systemic, because systems control people, there's all these psychological issues in having systems in place. Um, there's an emotional bit because of the human development. The physical stuff is the, the sensory stimulus we get from our surroundings. So it's a, it's a complex subject. But if we don't change the sensory stimulus that we expose people to, we don't change action. And yet we all talk about behaviour and action and plans and you know, all these kind of things. Um, but we don't actually focus on what root cause of that is, which is changing neural wiring and firing patterns and beliefs, if you want to summarise it under that word. Okay, so that's neuroscience, that's the brain, just very briefly, and this, um, I'm running out of time already. Looking at psychology, which is the mind that evolves from that brain. So we've got the physical construct that does, that does all this processing work, but it, when it acts together in all the different parts, it, it gives us what we refer to under the terms of psychology. So very quickly then, learned helplessness. Martin Seligman, about 1967 I think it was, and I hope there's not too many animal lovers in here, it's not a very nice story. It's experimental psychology, there were some horrific things done over the last couple of hundred years. But basically Martin got hold of a dogs, a number of dogs. There was an electric plate here and a, a, a non-electrified plate here. And he got the dogs and he strapped them down to the electric plate and he electrocuted the crap out of them, literally. Okay? It's not something to laugh at. <laughs> so <laughs> he kept electrocuting them all day long. And then he took the straps off and electrocuted them again. 70% of those dogs didn't move off of the electric plate, they stayed there and took it. 
because their brain had rewired in the space of a day to say no matter what I do, whether I scream, howl, strain against the straps, no matter what I do, I can't move. I have got to get to a point where I just get through this because it does eventually stop. Okay? Now, adult mammalian brains, whether they're in dogs, monkeys or humans, have got the same limbic system, the same emotional cortex. So we all kind of respond the same way with the same chemicals and the same neural rewiring. So when we're exposed as humans to systems that we can't seem to affect, guess what we do? We give up. There's a nurture nature argument here as well because 30% of those dogs did get up and move across to the non-electrified plate and escape the pain. So there's a genetic element, but I'm not going to get into genes today. Okay. What else do we get left with psychologically? A 70% negativity bias. Why do you think we buy newspapers? Yeah, because they sell bad news and we can really, really easily associate to that. And why do we easily associate to bad news? Because it's part of our defence mechanisms, it protects us. If we know what bad can come, we can prepare ourselves and get ready to deal with it. Okay? And like I've said before, that means we don't have to consume as much glucose energy, we don't have to find so much food in the world. Okay? We don't have to put so much effort into living in survival. And then finally, there's four drive theory. Um, so this is on the positive side of things. We've dealt with some of the negative issues of psychology. On the positive aspect, we are driven by, if you summarise it all up, four elements, which is to bond, okay, in our social relationships, to defend ourselves and our position in life, to learn and feel like we're making progress, and to acquire, which means getting more good things for ourselves, new clothes, new cars, houses, holidays, whatever it might be. And then finally, and it comes back to some of the things that are being spoken about this morning already, the seeking mechanism. It's got a great name. It's called a dopaminergic mesolimbic pathway. And it's dopaminergic because it responds to dopamine. It runs over the top of our heads, um, just above the limbic system. So it's dopaminergic, but mesolimbic, and it's a pathway of neurons. And the good thing about this is it's an opiate receptor. And dopamine is an opiate-based chemical, so it's a bit like getting a cocaine hit. Not that any of you have tried that, and nor have I, but I'm told that it's the same kind of feeling and feeling good about things. So when we feel like we're making progress, when we feel like we're learning and defending and bonding and we've got a nice balance in our lives and we're going forward towards a goal, which is why vision and mission and strategies and all these kind of things become very important in business, we actually feel really, really good about ourselves. But it doesn't last too long. So we need really, really good communication and psychologically aware communication to make sure that people continue to feel good about themselves and can do their best at work. Okay, so what we end up with is this situation. Depending on the person's imprinted wiring and firing patterns, what we're really dealing with as leaders of teams is this array of brains that are programmed to react, and they're programmed to react in terms of fear and defence. And it's largely in our own self-interest. Okay, that's what we're actually trying to manage, the, the wiring and firing patterns in brains. We talk about people, we talk about behaviour, but they're all proxy terms for what's really going on. Okay, so I said we're going to cover a couple of points, how we become who we are, and how targets and KPIs complement and contaminate behaviours. So hopefully that's, I mean, I, I've done this for 29 years. Um, I've managed to get this down to about two and a half hours tops uh, in the past. <laughs> so to do it in 20 minutes is perhaps a bit of a strain, but I'll try and finish off with the point <coughs> that I'm trying to make. That sets context, uh, and it's important to be able to make sure we can do the final bit. Okay, targets and KBIs. Uh, you, you might recognise some of these. Deathly silence, I've picked the wrong ones. <laughs> okay, so these are the kind of things, but remember, what did we say earlier? Telling is destructive. Where do these KPIs come from? Do they come from the people that have got to achieve them? Not usually. They usually come from the managers that sit in offices that have really good ideas and brainstorming sessions and really other good things like that. Don't they? Yeah. yeah. And get made separately from the people and then they get imposed upon people. And guess what happens? They start to trigger the fear-based defence mechanisms and all those kind of things that are going on. They become a judge judgement mechanism. If we don't achieve them, we're wrong in the world. Yeah? We start to feel guilty. You know that, that face that your mum pulls like this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? You've all seen it too. You know my mum. <laughs> <So> <laughs> Bless us. I'm, I'm joking. Um, that, is, that is guilt. That is guilt. And, and KPIs and targets and all these things, when they're imposed upon us, when they're to we're told what to do, can create the same emotional response. Guess what happens when we've got that emotional response? All the glucose energy that can be used for the prefrontal cortex, where we make our executive decisions, where we think rationally, gets diverted to the amygdala, and we start reacting like those teenagers we saw earlier. 
Okay, and because we haven't got the glucose energy that needed to go to our um, major and minor motor control cortices, we can make physical mistakes, we can make judgment e errors, we can do all sorts of things wrong because of the situation we find ourselves in. And we end up feeling a bit like that, and it's all about this failure and rejection. Okay? So, I've just said that, the glucose energy diverts, um, and, and we just, we, we're confused. We said telling is destructive, Imposed KPIs and targets leave you no neural or psychological capacity to satisfy these kind of things. And we talked about HR a minute ago. HR is focused on engagement and ownership and empowerment and autonomy and resilience and all these lovely words, aren't they? Yeah. But they don't deal with the root cause issues. They don't think about what have we got to do to create the conditions in which people can perform at their best. They, they talk about it as if it's something that happens because of a plan or a process. It's not. It's, it, things happen in business because of the way human beings respond and react and think and what they believe. Because belief sits at root, as we saw earlier, of our actions. So there's no point focusing on actions because it takes us nowhere. We have to focus on what people believe. And then we get back to the golden circle and somebody else said about you know, the, the trunk of the tree, didn't you earlier, and about why we exist. And that links into having passion. And passion is another neural chemical response mechanism okay so the other interesting thing for me of course is that on the other side of the fence we go into the way we approach change for things like lean and agile and six sigma and make all exactly the same mistakes okay make it even worse and i'm one minute over <laughs> make it even worse what we do with um people is we say you're really good at this aren't you and so what we'll do is we'll put you in this department that focuses on that product on, on that um, function on that, on that process and we keep them there and they have the capacity to be able to hit these targets and KPIs within that process, within that function because there's got to be an output for that because somebody above them better than them knows what's got to happen in each one of these processes throughout the organisation to come together and give organisational performance. But the thing is in the next department they get another set of KPIs that completely conflict with the previous KPIs and they're driven to do things that detract from what the other people are doing and the same and the same and the same again. So you might get a budget to consume if you're uh, a sort of semi um, public sector environment kind of controlled by a um, regulator or something like that but at the same breath you might be saying we've got to consume the budget we've got because we can't get the budget again next year but we'll also say we need to make savings okay so we've got and that's a really easy massive example but there's conflicting KPIs throughout businesses throughout the world I've seen them everywhere what does it do to people it leaves us with this term cognitive dissonance where we what we cognitively understand about the world isn't right it doesn't fit and what that does is it leaves us with stress and what that means is we're releasing more stressor hormones into our systems which means we're not doing ourselves any good at all because cortisol attacks cells and we end up with heart problems and we end up with bad health and all these other issues so the environment really that we create as leaders dictates not only the psychological capacity for people to act but it has a physical effect on them as well okay we, we hear these things that we initiate fatigue Kamikaze Kaizen, systemic, systemic disconnects. You know, th these are all things I'm sure you're probably all aware of. What I want you to try and get across today is when we hear about those things and we talk about targets and KPIs, what we're really talking about is all that stuff we've just whizzed through in 20 minutes that normally takes two and a half hours. <laughs> that comes from 29 years. Okay, so today what I'd like to say is we can understand the science behind these terms. We can help leadership teams understand those science behind those terms so they've got the same knowledge to make decisions on. Okay, and we can address the physical, emotional and social and systemic conditions that people find themselves in to help companies perform better. Um, that's it for me. Um, I've done well on the social media thing. Look, so <laughs> hopefully somebody's happy that I've got all those uh, platforms you can get in touch with me on. Um, thanks a lot. Cheers.